And now for the exciting conclusion of Zork Conquest at Kyendor. We were about to use the doormat and letter opener to get the key from the other side of the door. Uh, so we're going to go to page 104. Biv, remember that mystery we read last year in English class? Remember how that detective got through the door that was locked from the inside? You mean the one where he put a placemat under the door to catch the key as it fell from the lock? Right! We could use the doormat I found and do the same thing with this door. What a great idea, Duran. Let's try it. Duranda slides the doormat halfway through the space under the door, positioning it just under the lock. Then she pokes the letter opener into the keyhole. There's a faint thud, and a tiny cloud of dust rises from the doormat. Duranda slowly pulls the doormat out from under the door. Sitting right in the middle of the mat is a rusty iron key. You're a genius, Duran! Vivotar slaps her gleefully on the back, then picks up the key and easily unlocks the door. They enter the room and gasp at the shining radiance of the golden helm of Zork. Duranda gingerly picks up the helm, turning it from side to side, admiring its beauty. Suddenly, a cold wind blows through the room. The wooden door slams shut behind them. They whirl around and see GR floating in the air behind them. For once, its face is unsmiling, but frozen in a mask of cold hatred. It speaks in a voice dripping with malevolence. Your victory now turns sour. The helm's not yours for long. Twill be buried with this tower when the whirlwind sings its song. This time, the creature fails to disappear after finishing its cryptic message. Instead, its sucker-covered tail begins to whip back and forth faster and faster. From outside the room comes the sound of a powerful wind wailing round and round the turret. The floor of the room begins to quiver as the noise of the wind rises to a crescendo. Bits of mortar from the ceiling crumble down on top of them. The tower's collapsing, screams Duranda, barely making herself heard above the roar of the wind. The bead! Use the magic bead, yells Bivotar. Do you have the magic spell for stealing the power of the wind? Go to page 68. If you don't but want to stay here in the tower of the ruined castle anyway, go to page 114. If you want to use the magic bead to return to the castle of Zor, go to page 116. Uh, I don't think we have the power, the magic spell for stealing the power of the wind. Um, and we definitely are not going to stick around. Uh, let's use the magic bead. We're going to go to page 116. Duranda reaches into her tunic pocket and grabs the bead. She dashes it against the stone floor. A swirl of color light surrounds the two adventurers. It grows brighter and brighter until they are forced to cover their eyes. Suddenly, the light is gone, and they are standing in Soivar's chamber in the castle of Zork. Lager Mithar leaps from his chair at Soivar's bedside. You found the helm! Fluttering fraudnoids! You two are amazing! This treasure has defied the greatest adventurers for centuries, and you two find it in the wink of an eye. How's Soivar? asks Bivotar. Lagermithar's excitement fades instantly. Very bad. His condition worsens hourly. He looks off into the distance, and Bilvatar spots a tear forming in the corner of his eye. Lagermithar takes the helm from Duranda and says, I must leave at once. Kiendor is a day's journey, and the conference begins at midday tomorrow. He glances at Soivar. It hurts me to leave my father, knowing I may never see him again. Yet I know that I am doing what he would want. After a brief hesitation, Lagermithar adds, If my father should die before this treaty is signed, all we have done will be for naught. The assembled leaders would feel the passing of so great a wizard and would know of my charade. It would mean the end of Kindor and all that Soivar has worked for. I ask for one final favor. Stay here and watch after my father, as I wish that I could do. We will, Lagermither, says Duranda earnestly. Lagermither strides out of the room, 
and as he descends the stairs, they hear him calling for his swiftest steed. The next day, Bivotar and Geranda are sitting by Soivar's bedside when the healer enters to examine him. Soivar is almost as pale as his white silk bedsheets, and his breathing is shallow and irregular. After a brief examination, the healer motions them to the other side of the room. He has taken another turn for the worse, the healer begins. He will not last the night. Isn't there anything we can do? asks Bivoltar. There is one thing we could try. Our alchemists have been working day and night. Developing a procedure of potions and magic spells that might work to save Soivar. What are we waiting for? asks Duranda. Wait, cries the healer, and listen. This procedure is completely experimental. It has not even been tried on the alchemist's test animals. It could help Soivar, or it could kill him on the spot. Lagrimitha has left Soivar in your care. The decision is up to you. Do we forbid the healer to use this experimental procedure? Go to page 120, or should we allow it? Go to page 122. Well, uh, it doesn't look like we have much choice. If we don't do anything, I think Soivar is going to die. We're going to we're gonna allow it. We're going to go to page 122. Without this experimental treatment, Soivar will die, says Duranda. I say we give permission to the healer. Bivotar nods. Even though it's risky, it's the only chance he has. The healer asks Bivotar and Geranda to wait outside the room while he and his assistants work. Muffled noises, like tiny explosions, can be heard through the closed door. Occasionally bursts of light, accompanied by strange odors that burn the nostrils, stream through the cracks around the door. After what seems like an eternity, but was in fact less than an hour, the healer opens the door and motions them inside. Soivar is still lying in bed, deeply unconscious. However, there is color in his cheeks again, and his breathing is deep and regular. It is too early to say anything with certainty, explains the healer. But I think that Soivar will now recover. Several hours later, Lagermither rides into the courtyard of the castle, treaty in hand. The helm of Zork fooled everyone at Kiendor, he calls to them, waving the treaty. They really thought I was Soivar. The next day, Soivar regains consciousness. For the first time since his battle with Grawl, Lagermither tells him all that transpired during his illness. Soivar calls Bivotar and Geranda to his bedside. Beaming, he humbly thanks them for their courageous help. I love you as I love my own son, he says. We love you too, says Geranda, sniffling a bit. Congratulations for the Treaty of Kiendor, as Bivotar, sniffling even more than Geranda. You deserve the congratulations as much as I do, says Soivar. Return again to see the blossoms of the seed we have planted at Kiendor. He nods, and they suddenly find themselves behind the dugout of the ball field back home. Once again, they're wearing their uniforms. The sky is clear, and the game is still in progress. One of their teammates spot them as they slip back into the dugout. Hey, Bill! June! I can't believe you guys ran off during that lightning storm. It only lasted five minutes. <laughs> what a pair of cowards. Bill, smiling knowingly at June, asks, What inning? Bottom of the ninth. We're behind by two runs. Two outs already, and Ed's at bat. Ed is the weakest hitter on the team. Just then, Ed lines the ball into deep left field, legging it out for a double. June, yells Coach Rock. Quit napping and get up to the plate. Bill, you're supposed to be in the on-deck circle. The pitcher, who seems rattled by the sudden extra base hit, throws four pitches in the dirt to June. She drops the bat and trots down to first base. Bill steps up to the plate. The first pitch is far outside, but Bill swings anxiously at it. Strike one, cries the umpire. Let him walk you, 
calls Coach Rock from the dugout. The next pitch is right down the heart of the plate. Bill, slightly shaken, takes it for strike two. Concentrate, Bill, the coach yells. The pitcher tosses the ball toward the plate. Bill connects solidly with the ball. It sails high into the air over the outfield. The center fielder runs back towards the fence. He leaps for the ball. It nips the edge of his glove and falls over the fence for a home run. Coach Rock is waiting as June and Bill cross. The plate with the tying and winning runs. Way to go, he says, slapping them on the back. I guess you two will have something to talk about for a while, eh? The end. Your score is 10 out of a possible 10 points. Congratulations. You would make a fine adventurer. Excellent. Nice. And with that, we conclude our reading of Zork number four, Conquest at Kiendorf. Hey, thank you for hanging along with me during this adventure. I hope you liked it. If you listen to the whole entire thing, I want to know. Leave me a comment. Leave me a thumbs up. Mostly, I just want to know that you listened to this and you made it all the way to the end. So just leave me a little note that says uh, you, you made it to the end and, and let me know if you liked it or not. Um, and be sure to check out my other videos. we got lots of other great game books and we're always coming out with more. So this is Sprocket and I'll see you in the next video. Have you made it this far in the video? All right, I got a little bonus for you. If you made it to the very end, I was going to show you what happened when my dog got a hold of the book. <laughs> so this is uh, Zor Conquest at Kiendor. I, I think he just wanted to help us make some of the decisions, or maybe he was letting us know this was not the best game book uh, in his opinion. So at any rate, I love my dog, so it's not a big deal. We'll, we'll continue on with another book in the next video. Thanks for watching.